This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. For certainly I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Now we shall be blessed with a selection from our musician. Beginning with the first, first verse. 
And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip <coughs> for your journey, neither two coats, <coughs> neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. And there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whatsoever, or rather, and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I read unto you the first 15 verses of the 10th chapter of the book of the Gospel of Matthew. May your hearts Ponder upon it, may your minds be fed by it, and may your souls rejoice with it. Now let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are gathering together as the church, still not yet being able to come together physically, but we come together spiritually. For the church is not a building, it's not an edifice. The church is us, we, your people, where the Spirit abides. And Father, though we may be separated by distance, we are never separated from thee. And you have given us the means where we can still connect with one another whether by telephone or computer. God, we are still praying for one another. God, we are still preaching to one another. We are still lifting up prayers for healing for one another. And God, we just want to thank you today. In the midst of toil and strife, in the midst of unrest and injustice, God, we thank you for standing with us. And God, this morning, we give your name all of the honor, the praise, and the glory. For truly you are magnificent. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Now we shall have another selection from our minister of music.
That should be every believer's dream, wish, hope, desire to make it over and to make it home. For we are just sojourners passing through a place called Earth. This is not our ultimate uh, place of abode, but we are to be with our Lord and Savior forever. I read the first 15 verses out of Matthew 10, but I want to use two verses to focus on out of this text for today's sermon, verses 7 and 8. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, Freely ye have received, freely give. Jesus' command to his twelve disciples, to the original twelve, and of course there were many other disciples, and he tells them to take nothing for the journey. No money, nothing an extra pair of shoes or coats or staves or staffs for support. He says, don't take anything. For a workman is worthy of his meat. And also to understand that Jesus is saying that he is the provider, that God the Father provides. And that they have to learn to trust in Jesus. If they had other stuff, it would minimize their trust in the Lord. Now, not that necessarily the ability, but it would minimize because they had other things to lean towards or lean on. But when you have nothing else, you have to lean on Jesus. And there are some people who are at that place now who have nothing else but Jesus. And so for today, I want us to preach from the subject, or I'll preach, and you be right there with me, from the subject, become, rise up, and go. Become, rise up, and go. Lord, we are here, and we are like the early 12. Teach us what we must do, what we must become. Teach us how to rise and to go and to trust in you as we go. To perform the miracles and cast out the demons. And demons can take many forms. Evil can look in many ways. Help us now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a wonderful legend about St. Francis of Assisi, who was a very kind 13th century monk. And one day he informed his brethren that he planned to go into the nearby village on a preaching mission. And so he invited a novice to go along with him. And on their way to this uh, village to preach, uh, they noticed an injured man. And Francis promptly, he stopped. And he saw to this poor fellow's needs. And he arranged medical care for him. And they went on and soon passed a homeless man who was near starvation. And again, Francis stopped his journey and he ministered to this hungry, homeless man. And so it went throughout the day. There were people in need. 
And Francis lovingly cared for them as best as he could until he saw the sun was getting low in the sky. And so he told his novice friend it was time for them to return. Time to return to the monastery for evening prayers. But the young man said, Father, you said we were going to the town to preach to the people. And Francis smiled. And he said, my friend, that's what we've been doing all day. That's evangelism at its most faithful. That's what it looks like. Ministry to people in their need. Not worrying about numerical growth or adding to one's own conversion record or winning a claim within the denomination. Evangelism is sharing the love of God in concrete form among God's people. Catherine Matthews reminds us that the church is to be in motion, in motion, moving, not dwelling in a static uh, building or stay at home, preserve our level of comfort and letting them come to us spiritually, mentality, but embarking on a bold, going out into the world that loves God so passionately sharing what God has given us with those who have not yet heard God speaking to them. It's not that they haven't heard about God, but they have not yet heard God speaking to them. Or they haven't felt the touch of God's love upon their faces or upon their lives or have not known how to name either one. Maybe they felt it. Maybe they felt the touch of God, but did not know what it was. Matthew reminds us that Jesus didn't sit, but he traveled about curing and teaching and healing and bringing the good news to the poor. And when he saw the hunger and need and confusion of the crowds, he felt that profound compassion for them. Jesus both moved and was moved. And my sisters and brothers, we too are called to see the need of the world, its hungers and confusion. And like Jesus, we are called to be moved with compassion and to respond with tender care. And we are not called to sit still, calling ourselves Christians, but then we're sitting like the church of the chosen, frozen, sitting on logs like frogs. That's not what we're called to be, but to be like Jesus. Be on the move, open to those who we meet along the way. You may be moving to your destination. You may be moving to the shelter, but then you're passing 15 people along the way in need, but so narrowly focused the shelter, the shelter, the shelter. But what about those along the way who you can help, you have the ability to help, but you pass them by because of narrow focus. In Bible study, just Wednesday, um, we talked about how when Jesus was, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this ruler came to him and said, my daughter is dead. But I know you have the power. Just come and lay your hands on her, and she'll be made well. But in route, this woman with the issue of blood interrupted him and touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? Because he said, I, I felt virtue, I felt power lead me. Many instances in the Bible, while Jesus was on his way, he gets interrupted. It's okay to have interruption on your way to your destination. Interruptions help meet people's needs. This has powerful implications for how we see our ministry. It's tempting for us in the church to see its reason for being and meeting the needs of those of us who pay our way 
or perhaps like members of a private club. David Soren helps us to remember that there are no requirements. Let me say that again. There are no requirements to come and to hear about Jesus. Look at the people that Jesus sought out in the Gospels. The prostitutes, the hated tax collectors. Jesus didn't say, hey, you can't come around me unless you get it together first. I'm only here for those who've gotten it together. Let me tell you something. Church is not a country club mentality. A country club is a place where a whole bunch of people get together who have some things in common. Things like money, careers, and politics. They share values, and they share a certain way of life. They may even talk the same way. Where in the hood, some folk may say, y'all, uh, what that there over there? <laughs> but in the country club, it's, hello, my brother, how are you? Uh, what are your stocks like? They have things in common. And unfortunately, sometimes churches let that happen. And sometimes they let it happen to a degree that anyone from the outside or anyone with a past. And you know, I don't know how anybody in the church <laughs> can start focusing on folk with the past and forget that we all have a past. Nobody was born saved. We all have a past. But they're focusing on other folks' past or anyone who looks differently. And we make them feel uncomfortable or it feels uncomfortable for us. Let me say this. The church is not a club. It's not a club. If it was a club, many of us wouldn't be in it because they wouldn't allow us in. And we can't ever let that happen here. We cannot lose focus. We can't make it about us or having to be a certain way before you walk into the doors of the church. <coughs> what I love about the church is that a doctor, <coughs> excuse me, a physician, a PhD, any kind of doctor can sit next to an addict. Whether the addict is in recovery or addict is still using. Or a recovered addict can sit next to an executive. What I love, what I love about the church is a mother for can sit next to a single person. Porn addicts can sit next to people who are going to seminary. The church does not discriminate. I name those because oftentimes you don't know this. You don't know what's going on in someone's life. You don't know that. The church is for everyone because Jesus was and is and forever shall be for everyone. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't still have certain standards for our lives or standards for leaders. But it does mean that there is absolutely no standard for coming to hear about Jesus or for Jesus to love you or forgive you. Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God is reaching for everyone. The church is not a social club or a cruise ship to heaven. It's a military unit and one under constant assault from the enemy. So the author of Hebrews says we should not neglect to meet together, but rather stir up one another to love and good works and encourage one another. Well, because of this pandemic, we cannot meet together. But we can still encourage one another. <clears throat> we can still lift up one another. We can be six feet apart. You can knock on somebody's door, come into the house, be six feet apart, or stand on the outside, or pick up the telephone. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you have an Apple phone, you can use FaceTime. If you have an Android phone, I don't know how they work, but whatever it allows you to do, <clears throat> to be able to look at people face to face with technology. Use Skype, Zoom, WebEx, or some other technology and be able to lift them up, be able to look at their countenance and see if they're down. 
be able to read scripture together, turn on the television, see your pastor on TV, turn on the radio, turn on the computer, and look on the internet, and when you feel down, you can get on your knees and say, Lord, I need you now. You can ask for some prayer, for some prayer warriors that you know, and God will, God will, I say God will send you help when you need it. The Lord will answer your prayer. Daniel prayed, but he didn't hear from God for 21 days. But on the 21st day, the angel came and said, God heard you when you prayed from the very first time and you opened up your mouth and he dispatched me but the prince of the air. In other words, a demonic power wrestled with me. And I had to call on help and I wrestled and we wrestled together. But God heard you. That's what I want you to know that when you pray that if you are a faithful believer and sometimes it's not even when you're faithful because I know that when you're out there in the world, if you're sincere, when you open up your mouth and you call upon the name of Jesus, that God will hear because he said he didn't come for those who are, are, are perfect or those who are righteous, but he said, I came for the sick. And Paul tells us part of what we do as a church is to keep watch over each other, restore each other when we fall into sin. And each other's sorrows, we pray for one another, confess to one another, watch out for one another, and encourage one another to press on because sometimes if we tell the truth we feel like giving up sometimes the diagnosis is too hard sometimes the journey has been too long sometimes you've been fighting for a long time sometimes you get weary sometimes you get sick and tired of being sick and tired Sometimes you get tired of fighting and we need to learn to press on, to press towards the mark of the high prize of the calling of Christ Jesus. Don't give up now. You made it this far. The Lord has helped you make it all the way to where you are now. And if you made it this far, you can make it to the end. Don't give up now, but hold on. Hold on, hold on, and God will, I said God will help you to make it to the end. But learn to press on, and all because we know that one day soon our king is coming to take us back home. During America's early years, our land was filled with evangelism. It's no wonder there's a Methodist and Congregational Church. <clears throat> in nearly every town in New England today, circuit riders were so relentless in their ministry that on stormy days, there was a proverbial saying, there's nothing out today but crows and Methodist preachers. I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, it can be hard to go without being in church on Sunday, without being together in person, without being in community, but it's a sacrifice. But let me tell you what the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Missouri, Dion Johnson, says. He puts it this way. The church does not need to be open because the church never closed. We who make up the body of Christ, the church, love God and our neighbors and ourselves so much that we will stay away from our buildings until it is safe. But we are the church. We have to draw on untapped reservoirs of creativity in order to exercise our ministries, our gifts for compassion, for justice and joy in the face of unprecedented obstacles. And this is our hour to rise to that challenge. And we are reminded by Anne Lamott that grace bats last. My sisters and brothers, 
there may be someone today that this word has meant something to and for. And Lamont tells us that grace bats last. In other words, the cleanup batter. And you have those who know something about baseball and you have that batter that bats first and that one that bats second. But then that one that bats third. Last batter. Grace, everything else may come before, but we have the grace of God that sustains us. Been out in the world or still out in the world and you haven't made up your mind you're still doing what you're doing. You're not happy about it. But God has extended his grace and he's kept you. And others around you have died, have gone to prison, have been exposed. You may feel shame and guilt, but God extends his grace. And in his grace you can be renewed and you can find a, a new beginning. Just step forward and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you accept him, your new life has begun. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the peace of God that has sustained you. And may his grace that bats last forever keep you. In Jesus' name we